Welcome. We're going to continue a discussion today uh, relevant to ultrasound and undergraduate osteopathic medical education. And I'm going to be discussing at this point in time some very, very basic principles uh, relevant to the physics and physical aspects of ultrasound. Uh, my name is Dr. John Doherty. I'm the Associate Dean at Kansas City University of Medicine and Biosciences and I'd like to throw a little disclaimer out there that I am not a radiologist nor a physicist. So the perspective that I'm going to be giving you today comes from that of a medical educator. And our hope and goal in this uh, exercise is to have you to uh, have a small degree of understanding of the principles associated with this product. So we want to uh, begin with some very simple learning objectives that we hope to accomplish in this segment. And uh, as it relates to the physics of ultrasound, we want to define some simple principles of sound and then introduce how those principles translate into ultrasound and discuss how ultrasound is impacted by the tissue or material through which it passes. And hopefully these will help you have a better understanding of utilization of the tool of ultrasound in your uh, clinical education. First of all, sound is a mechanical longitudinal energy wave that travels in a straight line. If you've ever been at a uh, stadium uh, where there's been a loud crowd or you've experienced a sonic boom from an airplane, then you have a, a personal experience associated with this longitudinal, longitudinal energy wave as it hits you. Uh, at concerts when you can feel the bass going through your body, that is that mechanical wave. And how far you are from that wave is how you interpret the distance from you to the originating source. So understanding that simple principle will help us as we move forward in this discussion. Uh, the air in this example of the uh, sound that we're talking about is the media through which that wave travels through. Uh, there is a particular, uh, particular uh, aspect known as rarefication that can compress and uh, release like a spring. That is how that sound wave travels through that medium. In this case, it's going to be the air. So whatever the density of the material that it's passing through is going to have an impact on how that wave travels. So this is an example of a, what we have as a cycle. Uh, if you will, if you've snapped a rope when you were a child and you've whipped a rope as that wave travels through the rope, that is the exact type of principle that we're talking about in a cycle. Now the length of the cycle uh, for over one period of time is called the wavelength. And the cycle and wavelength is basically how long the period of time that it takes for that vibration to begin and end. So from the time you feel the vibration in your body from the bass that is played from an amplifier to the end of that vibration is one cycle or wavelength how much of an impact or the pitch of that particular sound wave is what we know as the amplitude. So it is a variance from baseline. So how far above or below your normal ambient sound is what an amplitude is. And that'll come into play when we start talking about uh, the strength uh, as it relates to ultrasound. Now the frequency is one cycle in one second. It's a very simple concept, and this measurement is in hertz. That is the frequency. So just like your radio frequency uh, has different, different changes on your dial, that is how it's measured in hertz. The amount of vibrations that occur in one second and the amplitude associated with that frequency is what we interpret as what we feel and hear as sound. Now, let's move into ultrasound since we've reviewed some of those very basic principles of sound. Again, ultrasound is the exact same thing. It's a mechanical longitudinal energy wave with a frequency exceeding the upper limits of human hearing. Human hearing is roughly 20, to, or excuse me, 20,000 hertz or 20 kilohertz, and that is what we can hear uh, every day. How ultrasound is produced is electricity is applied to some crystals. The crystals vibrate in essence. The crystals will create a cycle. And the material that is in the end of a probe head for an ultrasound scanner is where those crystals are. 
the frequency that these crystals uh, accomplish is between 2.5 and 10 megahertz. Remember, the upper limits of our hearing is 20 kilohertz, so you can do the math and figure out the difference. All right, so electricity is applied. It goes through the crystal, which is exemplified by the, uh, the capsule that we have there. And from the vibration, a longitudinal energy wave is produced. And the issue of ultrasound, diagnostic ultrasound in particular, it travels through the tissue, through the medium, and then it strikes something. And then it echoes, just like if you're in a canyon and you will get an echo in reply as it bounces off the canyon wall, so does the energy wave echo. It hits whatever structure it's looking to find, comes back to the crystal, and then the, the ultrasound machine transfers that energy, that return vibration, into another electrical impulse, which is then processed by the ultrasound system and puts the image on the screen for interpretation. So this beam comes out in a very thin slice. If you were to take a piece of paper and apply that down, it's about one millimeter thick. And that is the uh, depth of an ultrasound beam. The beam is not, um, does not do an accumulative sum of information if you move it from side to side. If you think of it kind of like you're going to be waving a fan and rotating it, that's how you begin to scan an image. You will have to have a constant point of entry, and then you can go width-wise, depth-wise, to help uh, ascertain the image of the structure, getting those sound waves to come back to the probe to, in, to get an image to interpret. This will give you a simple, flat 2D image. Uh, it's kind of like the old cartoons that we used to watch, Wiley I Co Coyote and, Speed, and uh, Roadrunner did not come off the screen like the kids expect them to do now with the 3D movies. It's a simple 2D image, and for us old timers, it's, it's very similar to a tomographic slice. Um, and at this point in time, there's no assumption of thickness. And again, the important uh, point of emphasis here is the individual controlling the probe is what controls the image on the screen. This, the image is only going to give you what it asks of you, what you ask of it. So you cannot overstate the probe for interpretation because it's, it's strictly up to you what you see. All right, here's an example of the size of these crystals. That's a human hair that's laid down on top of a probe, so you can see that it's as thick or thinner than a human hair. Now, if we're looking for a low frequency, the crystal is actually physically going to be thicker, and that will produce roughly a low frequency, a three megahertz uh, vibration. High frequency is thinner. There is, it can vibrate at a higher rate and can go as high as 10 megahertz. The importance of the size of the crystal has to do directly towards the frequency and what kind of resolution that you accomplish with that frequency. So the high frequency, the smaller crystal, it will vibrate faster, essentially. You're going to get more cycles per second. The problem with that is it's going to penetrate less. You can only look at shallow structures with the higher frequency crystal. The benefit associated with that is since the echo comes back faster, you are going to have a better resolution on the screen, the image that you're looking at. Now conversely, we're going to have a low frequency or the thicker, heavier crystal, which is going to vibrate at a lower cycle, and it's going to go deeper into the tissue because the width of the wavelength of that cycle is spread out. So it will have a greater ability to penetrate. This type of low frequency ultrasound will help you to accomplish deep structures. But again, there is a lot of other impacted uh, problems associated with a deeper penetration. And when it returns, you're going to get less of the echo back, so you're going to have less resolution with the lower frequency uh, cycle or vibration. So <clears throat> as the information comes back to the ultrasound head, the electrical signal will be interpreted by the ultrasound machine to show essentially dots on the screen. If you know your anatomy and you know what you're looking for, the dots are a lot easier to interpret. If you just are throwing up a slide like this and you have no idea what the point of reference is, 
unless you're an experienced radiologist, it's a challenge to understand what image you are looking for. The brightness of the dots will help you to understand how far the structure was or how dense the structure was relative to the ultrasound head. So if you have a brighter image, or you see some flat lines on this demonstration image, those are more dense structures because the echo is returned faster off of a thicker uh, type of material, like coming off of a tabletop, than it is going through air because it's going to return slower. So the location of the dots on the screen is a representation of the return of the echo, the velocity of the echo as it comes back through the tissue. Okay, so let's talk about tissue, interactions of the ultrasound with the tissue. This is a basic simple principle that hopefully most of us can understand. If you have a surface ship and they send down a pulse, all of us have seen enough movies to, you know, to understand what it sounds like inside of a submarine to have it pinged. That is in essence the same principle that we're talking about for ultrasound. The transmission of the sound, the pinging of the ultrasound from the boat is the transmission portion. <clears throat> we're going to explore and talk about gain, which is essentially volume or how loud that ping is, and then some dissipation of the sound relative to what we call acoustic impedance and the various aspects that impact acoustic impedance. Okay, so transmission, again, a pretty basic, simple concept. Uh, the ultrasound wave, as we said earlier, the lower the frequency, the farther it will penetrate, the higher the frequency, the shallower it will go. Um, these waves strike a medium represented by the lines and return back to the transducer for interpretation. The gain controls, like I said earlier, is how loud are you going to send that signal down. Um, it does not impact the return on the image, but if you wanted to increase the gain, then you're going to have a brighter image because you're basically taking your, for example, the distance issues you're going to send out those low frequencies, still at the same low frequency pitch, but you're, but you're sending it out a little louder. So the returning echo, just like if you were to yell in the canyon, you yell louder, the returning sound that you get is going to be louder. In that case, the image that you're going to capture is going to be brighter. You decrease the gain, you whisper in the canyon, and what you get back is a whisper, and on the image it's going to be interpreted as a darker image. So that is the principle of gain. Acoustic impedance is the absorption and or distraction of that sound wave as it is sent out and again on what you get in return. The denser the material, the thicker the material, the greater the impedance. So the more density it has to travel through, both going and coming back to, the less of an image you're going to get, the less response you're going to get from that vibration. So here's attenuation. Attenuation is basically uh, the deeper the wave travels into the body, the weaker it becomes. So it's attenuated. It loses its strength because the body or whatever tissue it's going through absorbs some of the material, some of the sound wave as it moves through. Um, there are other principles we're going to briefly review, but the important point is that different tissues have different uh, densities Air clearly is less dense than bone, muscle, soft tissue, blood, and water. And that's how we use those different densities to interpret what we're seeing on the ultrasound image. Absorption is pretty straightforward. I've got an example here of, the, of an eclipse of the moon to help illustrate it. Uh, basically, the, the light or the sound is absorbed by an impeding structure. And because of that impedance, there is no energy transferred on the other side of it because it completely absorbs and in some cases partially absorbs uh, the acoustic sound that is transmitted from the ultrasound head. Um, reflection is uh, a basic principle too. Think of it just like a mirror. You're only going to see the image back to you depending on how much light you have in front of you. If there is a dim light, the reflection coming back to you from that mirror will be less because your, your image in the mirror is actually that of the light off of your face into the mirror, not your particular flat image. So if there is something that reflects away from the transducer head, the uh, information that it's looking to receive, that will decrease your response back to the transducer and impact your image quality. 
Refraction and scattering is a similar concept and principle. Uh, refraction is the change in the direction of the wave uh, basically due to its speed. And we have an example here where it hits a, a flat structure and gets uh, diffused into different angles. Sometimes the uh, uh, trajectory is scattered and placed to a multiple different angles. And here's a very good illustration of that. We're all used to seeing rainbows. And as we know, that is a uh, change of the light as it goes through the, the water crystals in the air. And that's how we get the image of a rainbow. Same thing is applied in, the, in these uh, concepts of uh, refraction relative to um, reflection and scattering of the sound waves. It redistributes the angle of the sound wave away from the ultrasound head and that can impair, impact the ability for the ultrasound head to interpret what it is getting back from the structure that it's sounding. Okay, and then a simple word relative to both attenuation and gain. So, uh, this, the sound is impacted by the tissue, and remember gain is the louder that we yell at the tissue, the more we're going to get back from it. Um, the more tissue you have to penetrate, the more it's going to be absorbed, uh, more the signal is going to be absorbed, and the less return that you're going to accomplish in it. So what you can simply do, like we said before, is you can yell louder. So if you compensate by adjusting the gain, increasing how loud that frequency is going through the tissue, uh, whether it's a near field or a far field, you're going to get a better return. So in summary, those again are some very basic principles relative to sound and ultrasound. And that is the, the point of emphasis is that it's not much different than the echo that we talked about from you yelling in the canyon. If you understand that principle, it will help you to understand a lot of the basic principles when you're utilizing the ultrasound. Um, the echo concept, the energy concept where we can feel and absorb sound in our own chest may help you to understand what it is that the machine is capable of and what the machine is not capable of. And then finally, um, hopefully the, uh, the uh, thought of attenuation, of absorption of that sound wave uh, will help to guide you in interpreting and seeing what images return and what is being displayed on the ultrasound machine. So I hope this helps you to uh, begin your initial uh, understanding of how ultrasound works and thank you for your attention.